No course on reinforcement learning would be complete without a discussion of policy gradient methods. As we'll see, these techniques take a more direct approach to the problem statement of RL. And as a result, many of the most effective models are from this category. For example, proximal policy optimization is a type of policy gradient method, and that's OpenAI's go-to RL algorithm. In fact, that's what they use to incorporate human feedback into ChatGPT's training. Considering how much that product has grown, it's pretty clear these techniques have serious real-world value. Now, I'm not gonna cover proximal policy optimization. That's beyond the goal here. Rather, I'll cover the basics of policy gradient methods, which you'll need to know to understand the more sophisticated techniques. We have to walk before we can run. But before we start walking, I should mention, this is my sixth and final video on my series on reinforcement learning. If you find this video confusing, it may help to start from the beginning. Now let's take the first step. As mentioned, policy gradient methods are a more direct approach to our problem. That problem is, we'd like to determine a policy that'll achieve a lot of reward. To refresh, a policy gives the probabilities of taking actions in any state. For example, if we were faced with a 2D continuous state space, and in any state, we had four actions to choose from, then the policy gives us the agent's probability of taking each action in this state. Also, as the state changes, so do the action probabilities. So to reiterate, we need to determine a policy that'll achieve high reward for whatever this environment is. Also, we're still in the world of function approximation, meaning there's a hopelessly huge amount of atomic states that we could be in. So we'll have to assume policies of nearby states are similar. Now, in the previous video, our goal was to select a parameter vector w, which we would plug into some function q hat, such that it estimates the expected return of taking action A in state S. This is then used to determine a policy. In what we've seen, that policy would select the highest value action, while occasionally selecting an action at random for the sake of exploration. But now, with policy gradient methods, we're going to go completely around these value estimates. Our goal will be to select a parameter vector theta, which directly determines our policy. So, selecting a theta doesn't tell you any expected returns. Instead, it directly specifies the probability of every action in every state. And as we'll see, this comes with some nice properties. Now for an easy explanation of the first policy gradient algorithm, the reinforce algorithm, I'll emphasize how it shares a very familiar shape to the previous algorithms we've covered. The first thing is, it's a Monte Carlo algorithm. So no bootstrapping. We'll be waiting until the end of each episode to observe full returns to make updates. Second, we'll need to specify a few familiar things before running the algorithm. Item number one is the functional form of our policy. That is, we need the mathematical function which gives us the probability of each action given any state and a parameter vector theta. This is where you declare whether you use a neural net or a simple linear model or something else. Next, we need to specify the initial theta and the step size alpha. So this suggests a familiar routine, one in which we'll be applying repeated updates to theta, which will move it from an arbitrary position to somewhere which gives us high rewards. Also, alpha will dictate how aggressively we apply that rule. And the best alpha, like we've seen in the past, will be problem dependent. Okay, now knowing this, and knowing the general shape of Monte Carlo algorithms, we can guess the algorithm will look something like the following. First, we'll loop over m episodes, and for each episode, we'll sample a trajectory of states, actions, and rewards until the episode terminates. And I should emphasize that this trajectory depends on the current policy dictated by theta. Next, for each step of the episode, we'll apply some update rule to theta, where we're adding in an alpha fraction of something. And that something is what we'll figure out. So in preparation, what can we already say about this thing? Well, first, since we're adding it to theta, we can say it's a vector of the same length as theta. And second, it should make high rewards more likely. After all, that is our goal. Okay, so we'll keep these in mind as we try to fill in this missing piece. To do that, let's again consider a 2D continuous state space. This time, let's say that in any state, there are three actions available to us, left, right, and down. And for now, that's all I'll tell you about this environment. For the animation, I'll say that the lengths of these arrows gives us the probabilities of taking each action. So this means there's a 50-50 chance of going left or right and no chance of going down. So how should we form our policy? Remember, we need to be able to produce these action probabilities for any state we may run across. Let's use an idea similar to what we did in the last video. 
Let's fix two proto points in the state space, call them proto points, and let's say each has their own fixed action probabilities. We can accomplish that by declaring each action probability is a theta value. And so theta has length six, and we can use these to form action probabilities for any given point we might be considering. We'll do that by looking at the distances between the state and these proto points, and we can use those to determine weights. Then the action probabilities are just the weighted average of the proto action probabilities. The closer the point is to a proto point, the more similar its action probabilities are. So this is a workable idea, but there is a complication. Because our thetas are themselves action probabilities, they are subject to sum to one constraints. And these constraints will be nasty things to manage as we move over the space of thetas. So let's avoid them. To do that, we need to go on a bit of a tangent. We need a new function. We need one which will map to a probability vector a probability vector which has our action probabilities for left, down, and right. And what makes it a probability vector? Well, that's a vector where the values sum to one, like we want, and all values are non-negative. Now, since we're creating three values under one constraint, we'll be mapping from a theta vector of length two. And I'm leading things here a bit with the notation. There's a parameter for selecting left and for selecting right. To emphasize, the reason we're doing this is because these two values should be totally unconstrained and they should be able to produce any probability vector we might want. Okay, so what function gets all this done? Well, I bet many of you could have guessed this. It's the softmax function. It does exactly what we want by using the exponential function to map positive or negative thetas to positive numbers and then does some normalization to make sure everything sums to one. Okay, now with this tool, let's get back to our original problem. What we've done is justify a different parameterization. Now the question is, how will I represent it here? Well, for a particular proto point, I only have two theta values to represent, one for the left and one for the right. One idea is to represent them with bars, where the height gives the value and whether it's above or below the arrow tells us whether it's positive or negative. What's important is that these bars determine action probabilities. So this setting makes down very likely, this makes left very likely, and setting both to zero makes all actions equally likely. I'll admit, it's not the most natural visual, but it gets the theta values on screen and that'll be important. Okay, now let's say we have two proto points and once again, we distance weighted average them to give us two values for the state we're considering and those will get passed through a softmax to give us action probabilities. This is how we construct our action probabilities for any state we may come across. All right, in this setup, I'll ask you a question. First, we initialize all thetas to zero. Now, let's say that during the run of the algorithm, we run into this state and the left action is taken. And following that, a return of 10 is realized over the remainder of the episode. All right, here's the question. Seeing this, how should we nudge our thetas? That is, what should we have as our update rule? Hmm. Well, I certainly think the left action should become more likely since it yielded a positive return. I also think it should scale with the return. If we had only observed a return of five, then it makes sense our update should be half as large. Okay, with this, and if you know some of your multivariable calculus, you might guess this. What I've introduced is the gradient of the action probability at this state with respect to theta. For this video, it's useful to think of the gradient as the direction to nudge thetas that maximally increases the action probability in this state. Whenever you see this, I want you to think that. So I'll say it again slightly differently. The gradient is the direction to nudge thetas such that the probability of action A in state S is maximally increased. So what this rule is saying is, increase the probability of a positive return action in proportion to the return. If it's negative, decrease the probability. That sounds reasonable. In this case, we can picture that nudging like this. By design, it scales with the return, which matches our intuition. Also, if we had observed this return at a state much closer to a particular proto point, then that proto point's thetas would get a larger nudging. That's excellent. This model knows that protopoints should be informed by observations of nearby returns. 
And this happens because the gradient flows through our model, which has a sense of distance. Okay, now let's run this update rule in a rather contrived circumstance. Let's say the agent will repeatedly encounter exactly this state. If the agent selects left, it'll always get a return of 10. If it selects down, it'll get a return of five. And if it selects right, it'll get a return of minus seven. Now let's begin. The first randomly selected action is right. So we nudge in this direction. The next action is down. So we nudge in this direction. And this continues. If we wait long enough, eventually the strategy will learn to always pick the left action, the best action. Looks like we have a working rule, except we don't. Our update rule is wrong. We can see this if we start with a wacky initialization. To show this, I'll put the evaluation point here just to keep the animation decluttered. Okay, now we'll start with this initialization which corresponds to action probabilities of 20%, 60%, and 20% for the left, down, and right actions. Now from here, let's do the exact same thing. Okay, now this is weird. It seems down is becoming the most frequently selected action. That's not right. What's happening is, even though the best action, selecting left, results in a 2x larger step than selecting down, that larger step doesn't make up for the fact that, at initialization, the left action is selected far less often than the down action, and so the left nudging is applied less frequently. That means, as we apply these updates, the down action probability will start to dominate because it gets nudged often enough to compensate for its smaller step size. So to correct this, we actually use this update rule, where we divide by the action probability. This scales updates to account for the frequency of their application. And in fact, if you know your calculus, this can be equivalently written like this, where the natural log has snuck in. So just for good measure, let's see if this solves the problem. We'll restart with the imbalanced initialization once again, and now we'll run it with this new update rule. And excellent. We seem to be converging to the right answer of always selecting left. And again, that's because this new rule compensates for how often each action is selected. So now we can finally complete the reinforced algorithm we mentioned earlier. We can now see the algorithm in its full, fairly simple glory. For each time step within each of M episodes, apply the update rule as we just covered. Also, I snuck in the discount parameter gamma, which doesn't change the spirit of the algorithm. Okay, now let's apply it to something. This is an example I made up, so don't look for it anywhere else. I call it Windy Highway because I'm bad at naming things. Here's the setup. Like before, we have a 2D continuous state space and we will represent the agent state as a point. To view the actions and transitions, we'll need to zoom in a bit. We have three actions, up left, straight up, and up right. If the agent selects a particular direction, they'll move roughly in that direction plus a small bit of randomness. For example, if up left is selected, the state may move here. However, on a different selection of this action, the agent may land here, which is slightly different from before. And the same thing applies for the other actions. Okay, now let's talk rewards. First, there's no discounting. Second, the rewards are fully determined by the agent's horizontal position. That means we can picture the rewards like this. So if the agent lands here, they'll get a reward of one half. So the agent wants to spend a lot of time in this region. Next, I lied about how actions yield the next state. That was in the no wind case, but sometimes there is wind. That is, there is a horizontal wind, which is, again, only a function of the horizontal position. The magnitude of that wind is given with this curve, where a positive number indicates leftward wind and a negative number is rightward wind. So the wind is pushing the agent in these directions. And finally, Every episode begins at a random position at the bottom of the state space within this area. And the episode ends when we get to the top of the state space. To get a feel for this, I'll show a few episodes where we select the same action every time, along with the returns at each state. Here is what happens when we only select up. Here is what happens when we only select left. And here's what happens when we only select right. Okay, 
let's solve this game using reinforce. And remember, we have a few things we need to specify before we can use it. Let's start with explaining the model. Fortunately, I basically already did. I'll be littering the space with proto points, each with their own fixed pair of theta values. Like earlier, our policy at any point will come from taking a distance weighted average of theta values and passing those into a softmax to give action probabilities. Got it? It's just like what we did earlier. Also, we will initialize all thetas to zero and alpha will be 0.02. Now, this proto point theta view isn't very intuitive. So instead, I'll show the actual policy in many points over the state space. This will be easier to interpret. Here, I've colored the actions differently, and like earlier, their lengths tell us action probabilities. Now let's see this in action. What I'll do is flash an episode, and you'll see the policy slightly change. Now, as is typical of RL, there'll be a lot of episodes to get through, so I'll be skipping quite a few. You can see the episode index here. All right, now let's learn. All that's happening is the algorithm is learning to do more of what yielded high returns in the past and less of what yielded negative returns. In this case, the policy we learned is to approach the high reward region and to try to stay within it while fighting the wind. So that makes sense. It seems our algorithm works. Another way of seeing it working is if we plot the G0 return for every episode. But this is pretty noisy. So we can add a moving average line to get a sense of the trend. In fact, we can reduce the noise further by rerunning this 30 times and then averaging those moving averages. Okay, we can pretty safely say this algorithm works, but let's break it. The reinforced algorithm is never used in the simple form I presented because it suffers from an annoying problem. To see it, let's make a seemingly benign change. Let's add four to all rewards. That shouldn't change too much right? Well, it does. It slows down learning. I'll show you that slowdown later when I can compare it to an algorithm that fixes the issue. But for now, I'll explain why we have this problem. It comes from the fact that in this case, the return is always large and positive. And to see why that's no good, recall our update rule. Remember, this is the direction we need to nudge theta to make this action in this state more likely. And since the return is always positive, then all actions in every state visited will be made more likely. In other words, the policy never learns to not do things. It only learns to do more good things, which is everything in this case. The optimal policy is only discovered when the really good things have had a long time to overwhelm the pretty good things. So what's the solution? Well, the problem is the always positive return. So let's replace it with this where I'm introducing a new function. This function is called the baseline. Here's what you need to know about it. First, it can almost be any function without breaking the algorithm's convergence properties. Second, I said almost. It cannot depend on the action. And I'll explain this in just a second. And third, it's chosen to improve speed. That is, we'll choose it to solve our all actions get more likely issue. It turns out one natural choice for the baseline is actually an estimate of the value or the expected return of being in state S. This is just like the estimates we've constructed in previous videos. The reason this is good is because then this thing whose sign determines whether actions become more or less likely is positive for actions generating returns above the expected return from merely being in state S and negative otherwise. In other words, we evaluate actions relative to what is expected in the state where they were taken. That will solve our problem. Also, hopefully it's clear now why the baseline can't be any function of the action. If it were, it could favor some actions for us, and we want the environment to do that. Okay, now bring it together for you. The solution was to rewrite our update rule to this. To reiterate, this is useful because this is the direction to nudge theta to make an action more likely in a certain state. And so we need this thing to be positive for good actions and negative for bad ones, where good and bad are judged relative to some baseline. And so this makes the next algorithm, reinforced with baseline, pretty easy to guess. It'll just be like the earlier algorithm, except we'll use a new update rule, and we'll have to simultaneously learn a value function for the baseline. 
That would look like this. I'm not gonna walk through this in detail. It's exactly as I described, but I'll call out a few things. First, we need to now specify two functional forms, one for our policy and one for the value function. That's certainly a heavier lift. Second, we have two step sizes to choose, and we should expect that the choice of one will impact the best choice for the other, which complicates things a bit. Okay, now let's apply this to the all positive rewards version of Windy Highway. In this case, we'll define the policy exactly as we already did, and we'll define the value function in an analogous fashion. The parameters will be initialized to zero, and the step sizes will be this and this. Since the value function needs to be learned before we can properly judge actions, we give the value function a larger step size. Okay, now with all that, we can bring back the windy highway and rerun the algorithm. This time, we have something, the value function, to compensate for all those positive rewards. To emphasize, the value function is learning the value of being in any state so that the policy can be updated according to the relative value of action in those states. But this view doesn't show how much the baseline has helped us. To see that, we rerun the no baseline version 30 times to give us this average of moving average returns. And this is the same thing for the algorithm with a baseline. As you can tell, including the baseline creates quite an improvement. And if you're still curious, I've included a notebook in the description. There you can find details that should extinguish any lingering confusion. Okay, now everything I've said so far has been very example motivated but that betrays a certain theoretical perspective. What I'm talking about is we need to discuss the policy gradient theorem. And that starts with a question. What are we actually trying to do when selecting theta? That is, what is our objective to optimize with respect to theta? Well, in the episodic case, it must be the state value of the starting state, which is the expected return from that state. In this case, for simplicity, we're assuming there is a fixed starting state S0. Generalizing to a random starting state doesn't change anything important. The point is, we'd like to choose theta so that we get a high expected return. That's been the goal all along. Also, to emphasize, this is a true theoretical quantity. In practice, we never have access to this, only estimates of it. Now, the theorem states something remarkably useful. It tells us about the gradient of the state value with respect to theta. In particular, it says it's proportional to something. Proportionality is all we'll ultimately need, since how far we step in the direction is already a choice determined on a problem-specific basis. Okay, and that thing is this, which I'll break down. First, this is something we've seen before. It gives us the probability of being in a particular state if we bounce around according to the policy. And this means we're taking an average of something weighted by these state probabilities. And what is that something? It's this thing which is a weighted sum over actions in a particular state. The weights are the true action values. Remember, action values are the true, impossible to actually know, expected return of taking a given action in a given state. And the things we're weighing are these, the gradients, the direction to move theta if you want to make a given action more likely in a given state. So think of this whole thing as the weighted sum direction to move theta if you'd like to make high return actions more likely when in state S. And then the entire expression is just those averaged over states, again, weighted by the probability of being in each state. More simply, it's just a big weighted average of theta directions that make high return actions maximally more likely. And considering the left side is the direction to maximally increase the starting expected return, that sounds pretty reasonable. Now, why is this useful? Because it allows us to develop algorithms that will optimize the objective. In effect, if an algorithm approximates this direction, it'll approximately optimize the objective. In other words, any algorithm we develop that will nudge theta in a direction that on average equals this theoretical direction, then that'll move us to high return policies. In fact, if you look at the derivation of some policy gradient methods, you'll see they manipulate these terms to permit sampling of gradients that have an expectation equal to this theoretical direction. All right, and why is this remarkable? Because it only involves terms we can handle. This we can calculate exactly. This we can estimate with the methods we've seen. 
And this will naturally get factored in since we'll be applying updates as we bounce around the state space according to this distribution. To spark some appreciation, it doesn't involve something nasty like the gradient of the state distribution. The state distribution depends on our policy. And so this gradient may have appeared. And estimating how the state distribution changes with theta, that would be extremely messy and noisy. So it's good news we don't need to. All right. And as a final note, I'll make some general comments on policy gradient methods, which I'll now call PGMs. First, PGMs always involve smoothly evolving action probabilities. So if these are action probabilities of a PGM model at some state, and these are action probabilities of an epsilon greedy value-based method, like we've covered in previous videos, then as we process episodes, we might see an evolution like this. Notice the value-based method can make these large jumps in its probabilities. And that's because it's assigning high probability to the highest value action. And that's something that can change abruptly with changes in value estimates. And this has a few consequences. First, it can make naive PGMs slow and inefficient. The value-based method is willing to make big leaps in action probabilities. And the PGM approach is much more patient. Second, it gives PGMs nicer convergence properties since they're always able to make small advantageous adjustments. On the other hand, a value-based method can get stuck due to its discreetly determined extreme action probabilities. So I'll summarize these ideas like this. All right, next, it solves only for the policy. In a sense, it's doing the least it can to solve the problem, and that can be either a bad thing or a good thing. It could be bad since it may ignore relevant information. For example, a model-based method might learn overall dynamics of the environment, which might not impact the immediate policy, but may be useful for generalizing the policy to future circumstances. Or it could be good in that it may ignore irrelevant complexity. There may be environment dynamics that have no impact on the best policy and would otherwise soak up modeling capacity. Next, it can learn stochastic policies. Remember, in our epsilon greedy value-based approaches, the level of stochasticity was determined by epsilon, which gave us the probability of selecting an action at random. We needed to fix the choice of epsilon upfront, which meant it's not learnable. But the level of stochasticity might be a component in the optimal policy. For example, if the agent was learning to play poker, there might be a circumstance where it needed to genuinely flip a coin. That wouldn't be possible with the epsilon greedy approaches. And the last one I'll mention is, it avoids needing to argmax over actions. Remember, in our value-based methods, we have to repeatedly determine the max action value. Well, with many possible actions, that could be a slow operation. With PGMs, there is no need for this, and this makes it friendly for high dimensional action spaces. And that's it. That's the end of my series on reinforcement learning. I really hope it's made RL concepts intuitive, interesting, and maybe useful to you one day. Now, before I sign out, I'd like to show some appreciation to my sources. The most significant was reinforcement learning and introduction by Richard Sun and Andrew Bardo. I started this series because I read this book in 2021 and thought these ideas were so general and useful, they needed to be animated. Also, it's a phenomenally well-written and self-consistent textbook. If you're serious about RL, it's an absolute requirement. Also, DeepMind has a great lecture series that was quite helpful. There's a lot more information in those lectures than here, so check them out if you're still hungry. Lastly, OpenAI had some excellent material. In particular, their spinning up documentation was important for connecting these theoretical ideas to existing RL systems. I've included links to these in the description, so if you're aggressive, there's plenty of food there. But that's it. Again, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you again soon. Later. All right, I'm done. Yeah.